are to receive that, you must be in Christ Jesus. Now, there are no spiritual blessings outside of Christ Jesus. So it would behoove us to go to God's book and figure out how we get in. Wouldn't you think? If all of them are in, there's none out, I best be on the in. <laughs> Bible tells us in no uncertain terms. See, you find people believing, repenting, confessing, because Jesus commanded those things in John 8, 24, Luke 13, 3, Matthew 10, 32, and 33. And yes, we're immersed in water. We're baptized because Jesus commanded in Mark 16, 16. In Romans 6, 3, Galatians 3, 27, we gain entrance by the water. And you say, David, why the water? I say, lean not to thine own understanding. It's not for me to question God's plan. God used water in many instances in the Old Testament. He used it in the New Testament. It's up to me to believe and trust and do what He says. Once we're on the inside... We are to remain faithful. Revelation 2.10 Be thou faithful unto death and I will give unto thee the crown of life. Jesus has never gone back on one of his promises. So what do you do when you no longer know what to do? You go to Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 and believe it with every fiber of your moral being. You're here today and you need to respond to the Lord's invitation. If there's anything that we can do, any way we can help you, please come as we stand and sing. God is going to come without play.
and humbled to have been asked to be a part of this uh, wonderful night, this wonderful fellowship, to be able to speak tonight. I look out and I see so many more men that are far more qualified than I uh, to be given this lesson, but I feel very humbled to be here and to talk about the subject that we're going to talk about tonight. Weighty words. I like that idea. And unity surely is a weighty word, isn't it? I wonder, I wonder though, if we realize the weight of that word. I wonder if we give the time and the attention and the weight to that word and to that concept and to that idea that it deserves. I hope that we can, in a short little bit tonight, look at this idea, look at this concept, and maybe even re-examine how we look at unity in the church. The word unity literally means oneness, right? It's taking a a group or taking several various individuals and bringing them together and making them one. That's unity. You see, that's what Jesus did for us, isn't it? When we were saved, Acts chapter 2 and verse 47 says that the Lord adds us to His church. He makes the individuals one. And when I think about individuals becoming one, I, I think about a team. And, and I've, I've gotten a whole new respect for teams and sports here lately because my little boy, he's five years old. His name's Malachi. He's right back there. I, I have to mention his name so I make sure he's paying attention. But uh, Malachi started playing baseball this year. You know, you always think your kid is the very best in the whole world. And yet, then they, they, they get a part of a team. And then you bring in other little five-year-olds and six-year-olds and see how they interact with each other. It was especially funny the first game that Malachi played, the other team that he played against, as soon as Malachi's team would hit the ball, and you know, when I say hit the ball, I mean five or six feet, but the entire team, the opposing team, there maybe five or six, seven kids, would all run after the ball, they would all dive and dogpile on the ball, and they'd fight over it, and oh, well, that's my ball, that's my ball, and so they haven't quite figured out that unity thing, have they? So there's, there's more to unity than simply being on the same team. I think we need to understand that, don't we? That there's more to unity than simply being on the same team. You see, when a a major league sports team wins the the World Series, sadly it hadn't been the Rangers yet, but one of these days when the Rangers win the World Series, they'll probably talk about their unity. And when they talk about their unity, they're they're talking more than just that these... These several men are all part of one team. They're talking about how they get along. You see, and we could oversimplify the subject of unity, and we could say, well, if all of these individuals that make up a baseball team, if they all just studied baseball and the mechanics of baseball and what to do with the ball when you get the ball, and they just sit in a classroom somewhere and study baseball, then you bring them all out and you put them on the field and they'll play together perfectly. Is that how it works? No, that's not how it works, is it? Because personality dynamics are just as important when it comes to unity as baseball mechanics. It takes more than just the mechanics of understanding the game. There are separate individual personalities that come into it. Just because a bunch of guys out on the field understand the game of baseball... If they don't get along in the dugout, and they don't get along in the locker room, and they can't be friends off the field, they're not going to work together on the field. And when the ball gets hit to one of them, they're going to fight over it. They're going to be vying for position, and they're going to say, that's my ball. And somebody's going to call it, and they'll go after it because they don't get along. You see, unity in the church is more than just being on the same team. Unity in the church is about getting along, isn't it? Learning how to get along. And sometimes we oversimplify the subject of unity and we say it's just a doctrinal matter. And as long as we sit into a classroom and we understand doctrine perfectly and somebody else sits in a classroom somewhere else and learns doctrine perfectly, then we'll get along and we'll have unity. But that's just as wrong as the baseball analogy. You see, because when it comes to unity, it's as much a relational matter as it is a doctrinal matter. Both 
are important. Both are essential. And you see, I think we have two different sides in the church today. I think we have those that try to make the issue of unity just a relational matter. And they say all that matters is that we love each other and we get along. Forget about doctrine. Forget about right and wrong. Forget about a standard. Forget about a pattern. And let's just get along. But you see, relational unity without doctrinal unity is shallow and superficial. You can have that at the country club. You can have that on a social club. You can have that on a baseball team. But we're more than those things. But just as it's more than just relational unity, it's more than just doctrinal unity, isn't it? Because... Just having doctrinal unity and not having relational unity, it becomes very brittle and very fragile. So it's got to be both, church. And that's the the main point that if I get nothing else through, I joke that I have a 10-point lesson, but it's really not a 10-point lesson. It's a one-point lesson with 10 sub-points, okay? So the one point is this, that unity is as much a relational matter as it is a doctrinal matter. And I think as we look at Ephesians chapter 4 tonight, I think that that idea will come alive for us. Let's look at the first word, 10 different words as we go through Ephesians chapter 4. The first word is this, verse 1, standard. Now the word exactly isn't used, but I think the idea is there. Look with me, we're reading out the New American Standard, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1. Paul writes this, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. There is a manner of walking, a manner of living that's worthy, which would imply that there's a manner of living, a manner of walking that's unworthy, right? I'm not a rocket scientist here. I'm not a very smart guy, but I can figure that out. Then when you look at Scripture, there's a right way to live and a wrong way to live as a Christian. See, if you were part of a baseball team, they might say, hey, wearing that jersey means something. Live like somebody who's worthy to wear that jersey. There's a standard that you have to live up to on the field and off the field if you're going to wear that jersey. You see, we need to realize that there is a standard for living. One of the problems in the church today is that we've got a lot of people that are concerned about their standard of living and not their standard for living. It's time that we understand. It's time that we all get on the same page. If we're going to have unity, it means that there is a right way to live and a wrong way to live. That there is a standard. One of the reasons I think we struggle with unity so much is that we want Christian community without Christian accountability. We want to live in a Christian community where we have friends, we have somebody to lean on, we have people to help us, we have other people to bear our burdens, but don't you dare ask me about my private life. Don't you dare get into my business. That's my business, not your business. Don't you dare judge me. Paul says, look, If you're going to be a part of the Christian community, it means that you're going to have to submit to the Christian standard. You're going to have to submit to the Christian authority. There is a standard. There is a manner that is right and a manner that's wrong for how we live. And if we're going to have unity in the Lord's church, we've got to recognize and submit to that standard. We've got to live in the same manner. The second word is humility. I want to get more into the relational side of things here. And I don't want us to ignore that or overlook that because it's so important. And again, unity in the Lord's church is as much a matter of, it's as much a relational matter as it is a doctrinal matter. Chapter 4 and verse 2. With all, with all, not with some, not with a little, but with all humility. See, we've got to recognize that unity in the church begins with humility in me. Unity in the church begins... Thank you for tuning in to the Diligent Podcast, a work of Scattered Abroad, 
which is overseen by the East Hill Church of Christ in Pulaski, Tennessee. You can find our website at scatteredabroad.org. In this podcast, we talk about the Bible, speak the truth, and make Bible study come to life. Here is your host, Joshua Cantrell. On this season of the Diligent Podcast, we have been asking a question, and that question is, how do you handle, and we have been labeling that with a series of uh, different questions that have challenged us, that have encouraged us, but ultimately have convicted us to be more like our Savior, King Jesus the Christ. On this particular episode, we're going to talk about how do you handle, and we're going to label this episode enemies. How do you label enemies? And of course, throughout these next few episodes, uh, of course, we're going to talk about how we handle enemies. But before we do any of that, we want to talk about public enemy number one. And of course, that is none other than the devil. If I was going to introduce him to you, I would say, first of all, uh, that he is a liar. That's what he is, and that's who he is. He is rude. He is cunning. He is unmoved by our pain or our emotions. He wants to destroy your marriage and your children and everything around you. He wants to see the congregation you attend fail. He wants us to quit what we're doing. He wants to arrest your faith and he wants you to surrender. He has destroyed more homes than anyone. He has destroyed more marriages than anyone. He is not a friend. He is an individual we should not look to for guidance, comfort, or wisdom, for he is a liar. Satan has been battling in his own mind, if you will, with God, because I believe there is no battle going on. There is no comparison going on. The word battle gives implication that one is going to win and one is going to lose. In terms of God and Satan, God is always and always will be victorious. The inspired, the inspired writer John records for us in John 8, 44. Music recognition. Select. Music recognition. Selected. Screen recording. 